Conversation 1. Music Festival. Hi, George. Glad you're back. Loads of people have phoned you. Really? I felt just like your secretary. Sorry. I went into the library this afternoon to have a look at a newspaper and I came across something really interesting. What? A book? No, a brochure from a summer festival, mainly Spanish music. Look, I've got it here. Spanish music? I really love the guitar. Let's have a look. So what's this group, uh, Guitarini? They're really good. They had a video with all the highlights of the festival at a stand in the lobby to the library, so I heard them. They play fantastic instruments, drums and flutes and old kinds of guitars. I've never heard anything like it before. Sounds great. OK, shall we go then? Spoil ourselves? Yes, let's. The only problem is there aren't any cheap seats. It's all one price. Huh. Well, in that case, we could sit right at the front. We'd have a really good view. Yeah, though I think that if you sit at the back, you can actually hear the whole thing better. Mm, yes. Anyway, we can decide when we get there. So will you fill in the form, or shall I? I'll do it. Name, George O'Neill. Address, 48 North Avenue, West Sea. Do you remember our new postcode? Still can't remember it. Mm, just a minute. I've got it written down here. Ah, WS62YH. Do you need the phone, too? Please. I'm really bad at numbers. 01674-553-242. So let's book two tickets for Guitarini. OK. If you're sure, 750 each is all right. How do you feel about the singer? Mm, I haven't quite decided. But I've noticed something on the booking form that might just persuade me. What's that, then? Free refreshments. Really? Yes, look here. Sunday, 17th of June. Singer. Ticket, six pounds, includes drinks in the garden. Sounds like a bargain to me. <laughs> yes. Let's book two tickets for that. So, what else? I'm feeling quite keen now. How about the pianist on the 22nd of June? Anna Ventura. I've just remembered that's my evening class night. Mm, that's OK. I'll just have to go on my own. But we can go to the Spanish dance and guitar concert together, can't we? Yes, I'm sure Tom and Kieran would enjoy that too. Good heavens, £10.50 a ticket. I can see we're going to have to go without food for the rest of the week. <laughs> we'll need to book four. Oh, wish we were students. Look, children, students and senior citizens get a 50% discount on everything. If only. Conversation 2. Feedback on group's proposal. Right, Sandra. You wanted to see me to get some feedback on your group's proposal, the one you're submitting for the Geography Society field trip competition. Uh-huh. I've had a look through your proposal, and I think it's a really good choice. In fact, I only have a few things to say about it, but even in an outline document like this, you really have to be careful to avoid typos and problems with layout in the proposal, and even in the contents page. So read it through carefully before submitting it, okay? Will do. And I've made a few notes on the proposal about things which could have been better sequenced. Okay. As for the writing itself, I've annotated the proposal as and where I thought it could be improved. Generally speaking, I feel you've often used complex structures and long sentences for the sake of it, and as a consequence, although your paragraphing and inclusion of subheadings help, it's quite hard to follow your train of thought at times. Oh. So cut them down a bit, can you? Really? Yes, and don't forget simple formatting like numbering. Didn't I use page numbers? I didn't mean that. Look, you've remembered to include headers and footers, which is good, but listing ideas clearly is important. Number them or use bullet points, which is even clearer. Then you'll focus the reader on your main points. I thought your suggestion to go to the Navajo Tribal Park 
was a very good idea. Oh, I've always wanted to go there. My father was a great fan of cowboy films and the Wild West, so I was subjected to seeing all the epics, <laughs> many of which were shot there. Mm -hmm. As a consequence, it feels very familiar to me, and it's awesome, both geographically and visually. So it's somewhere I've always wanted to visit. The subsequent research I did and the online photographs made me even keener. Interesting. Right, let's look at the content of your proposal now. Did you find it comprehensive enough? Well, yes and no. You've listed several different topics on your contents page, but I'm not sure they're all relevant. No? Well, I thought that from the perspective of a field trip, one thing I needed to focus on was the sandstone, plateau, and cliffs themselves. The way they tower up from the flat landscape is just amazing. The fact that the surrounding softer rocks were eroded by wind and rain, leaving these huge outcrops high above the plain. It's hardly surprising that tourists flock to see the area. Well, yes, I'd agree with including those points. And then the fact that it's been home to Native American Navajos and all the social history that goes with that. The hardships they endured trying to save their territory from the invading settlers. Their culture is so rich. All those wonderful stories. Well, I agree it's interesting, but it's not immediately relevant to your proposal, Sandra. So, at this stage... I suggest you focus on other considerations. I think an indication of what the students on the trip could actually do when they get there should be far more central, so that certainly needs to be included and to be expanded upon. And I'd like to see something about the local wildlife and vegetation, too. Not that I imagine there's much to see. Presumably the tourist invasion hasn't helped. Okay, <clears throat> I'll do some work on those two areas as well. But you're right, there's not much apart from some very shallow-rooted species. Although it's cold and snowy there in the winter, the earth is baked so hard in the summer sun that rainwater can't penetrate. Mm -hmm. So it's a case of flood or drought, really. So I understand. Now, before we look at everything in more detail, I've got a few factual questions for you. It would be a good idea to include the answers in your finished proposal, because they're missing from your draft. Fine. So, you mentioned the monoliths and the spires, which was good. But what area does the tribal park cover? Do you know? 12,000 hectares. And the plain is at about 5,850 meters above sea level. Mm, larger than I expected. Okay, where's the nearest accommodation? That's a practical detail that you haven't included. Have you done any research on that? Yes. There's nowhere to stay in the park itself. But there's an old trading post called Goulding, quite near. All kinds of tours start from Goulding, too. What kind of tours? Well, the most popular are in four-wheel drive jeeps, but I wouldn't recommend hiring those. I think the best way to appreciate the area would be to hire horses instead and trek around on those. Biking is not allowed, and it's impossible to drive around the area in private vehicles. The tracks are too rough. Okay. Lastly, what else is worth visiting there? There are several caves, but I haven't looked into any details. I'll find out about them. Okay, good. Now what I'd like to know is more about... Conversation 3. Damage Claims Good morning, Total Insurance. Judy speaking. How may I help you? I recently shipped my belongings from overseas back here to Australia and I took out insurance with your company. Some items were damaged during the move, so I need to make a claim. What do I have to do? OK, well, first I need to get a few details about this. Can you give me your name, please? Yes, it's Michael Alexander. OK, and your address, please? My old address or my current one? Your current one. It's 24 Manly Street, Milpera, near Sydney. What was the suburb, sorry? 
Milpera. M I L P E R R A. Right. Now, who was the shipping agent, Mr. Alexander?、Mm, you mean the company we used? Yes, the company who packed everything up at the point of origin. Oh, it was、um, uh, first class movers. Okay.、Uh, where were the goods shipped from? China, but the ship came via Singapore and was there for about a week. Don't worry. All of that information will be in the documentation. Now the dates. Do you know when the ship arrived? It left on the eleventh of October and got to Sydney on the twenty eighth of November. Okay. I need one more thing. There's a reference number. It should be in the top right hand corner of the pink form they gave you. Ah,、uh, let me have a look. I have so many papers. Ah, yes, here it is. It's six o one A C K. Thanks. I need to take down a few details of the actual damage over the phone before you put in a full report. Can you tell me how many items were damaged and what the damage was? Yes. Well, four things actually. I'll start with the big things. My TV, first of all. It's a large one, very expensive. Our insurance doesn't cover electrical problems. It isn't an electrical problem. The screen has a huge crack in it, so it's unusable. I see. Any idea of the price to repair it? No. Well, I don't think it can be repaired. It will need a new one. Okay. I'll make a note of that, and we'll see what we can do. Now, what was the second item? The cabinet from the bathroom was damaged as well. It's a lovely cabinet. We use it to keep our towels in. And what is the extent of the damage? Well, the back and the sides seem okay, but the door has a huge hole in it. It can't be repaired. I'm really not very happy about it. And how much do you think it will cost to replace it? Well, when I bought it last year, I paid $125 for it. But the one I've seen here in Sydney is a bit more expensive. It's $140. Right. And what was the third item? My dining room table. It's a lovely table from Indonesia. It must have been very hot inside the container because one leg has completely split down the middle. The top and the other three look okay, thank goodness. Any idea of the price to repair it? Well, I had an estimate done on this actually because it is a very special table to us. They quote it as two hundred dollars, which is really pricey. So I hope the insurance will cover the total cost. I'm sure that will be fine.、Uh, what was the last item, Mr. Alexander? Well, we have a lovely set of china plates and dishes, you know, with matching cups, saucers, the lot. They were all in the one box, which must have got dropped because some plates were broken. Six, actually. And can you tell me the replacement value of these? Well, it's hard to say because they were part of a set, but they can be up to ten dollars each, as it's such a good set. Okay, so that would be around sixty dollars altogether. Yes, that's right. And is that all of the items? Yes. So, what do I have to do now? Conversation four: Research on honeybees. Good morning, everyone.、Uh, in today's seminar, Grant Freeman, a biologist who specialises in identifying insects and who works for the Australian Quarantine Service, has come to talk to us about his current research work. Right. Well,、uh, over to you, Grant. Good morning, everyone. I'm sure that you know that the Quarantine Service regulates all food brought into Australia. Well, obviously they want to protect Australia from diseases that might come in with imported goods, but they also want to prevent insect pests from being introduced into the country, and that's where I have a part to play. Anyway, my current research involves trying to find a particular type of bee, the Asian honey bee, and finding out whether there are any of them around in various states of Australia. We discovered a few of them in Queensland once and eradicated them. Now we're pretty keen to make sure that there aren't any more getting in, particularly to New South Wales and other states. What's wrong with Asian honeybees? Are they so different from Australian bees? Well, in fact, they look almost the same, but they are infested with mites, microscopic creatures which live on them. And which can seriously damage our own homegrown bees, or could even wipe them out. 
Well, what would happen if Australian bees died out? Well, the honey from Australian bees is of excellent quality, much better than the stuff the Asian bees produce. In fact, Australia exports native queen bees to a large number of countries because of this. When the European honey bee was first discovered out in the bush, we found they made really unpleasant honey, and they were also too big to pollinate many of our native flowers here in Australia. That must have had a devastating effect on the natural flora. Did you lose any species? No, we managed to get them under control before that happened. But if Asian bees got in, there could be other consequences. We could lose a lot of money because you might not be aware, but it's estimated that native bees' pollination of flower and vegetable crops is worth one point two billion dollars a year. So in a way, they're the farmer's friend. Oh, and another thing is, if you're stung by an Asian honey bee, it can produce an allergic reaction in some people. So they're much more dangerous than native bees. How will you know if Asian bees have entered Australia? We're looking at the diet of the bird called the rainbow bee eater. The bee eater doesn't care what it eats as long as they're insects. But the interesting thing about this bird is that we are able to analyse exactly what it eats, and that's really helpful if we're looking for introduced insects. How come? Because insects have their skeletons outside their bodies, so the bee eaters digest the meat from the inside. Then they bring up all the indigestible bits of skeleton, and of course the wings, in a pellet, a small ball of waste material which they cough up. That sounds a bit unpleasant. So how do you go about it? In the field, we track down the bee eaters and find their favourite feeding spots. You know the places where the birds usually feed. It's here that we can find the pellets. We collect them up and take them back to the laboratory to examine the contents. How do you do that? The pellets are really hard, especially if they've been out in the sun for a few days. So, first of all, we treat them by adding water to moisten them and make them softer. Then we pull them apart under the microscope. Everything's all scrunched up, but we're looking for wings, so we just pull them all out and straighten them. Then we identify them to see if we can find any Asian bee wings. And how many have you found? So far, our research shows that Asian bees have not entered Australia in any number. It's a good result and much more reliable than trying to find live ones as evidence of introduced insects. Well, that's fascinating. Thank you, Grant, for those insights. I hope that you might inspire some of our students here to conduct some similar experiments. Conversation five: Renting a house. Good morning. How can I help you? Hello. I'm interested in renting a house somewhere in the town. Right.、Uh, could I have your name, please? Yes, it's Stephen Godfrey.、Mm -hmm. And tell me how many bedrooms you're looking for. Well, we'd need four because I'm going to share the house with three friends. Okay. There are several of that size on our books. They mostly belong to families who are working abroad at the moment. What about the location? It'd be nice to be central.、Oh, that might be difficult, as most houses of that size are in the suburbs. Still, there are a few. What's your upper limit for the rent? We'd like something around five hundred pounds a month, but we could go up to six hundred pounds if we have to. But we can't go beyond that.、Mm -hmm. Do you know how long you want to rent the house for? The minimum let is six months, as you probably realise. We're at college here for two years, and we don't want to have to move during that time if we can avoid it. Right. And how soon do you want to move in? All our lets start on the first of the month. Well, as soon as possible, really. So that means September first. Okay. Let me have a look at what we've got.、Uh, we have photographs of all the houses on our book, so you can get an idea of what they're like. There's this one in Oakington Avenue at five hundred and fifty pounds a month, combined living room and dining room with a separate kitchen. It doesn't have a garage, though you can park in the road. Ah,、uh, we'd prefer to have one if possible. Right. Then have a look at this house in Mead Street.、Mm -hmm. It's got a very large living room and kitchen, bathroom, cloakroom. How much is it? That one's five hundred and eighty. It's very well furnished and equipped. 
It also has plenty of space for parking, and it's available for a minimum of a year. Oh, and there's a big garden. I don't think we could cope with that, to be honest. We'll be too busy to look after it.、Mm, okay.、Uh, then there's this older house in Hamilton Road. Living room, kitchen, diner, and it has a study. Uh, five hundred and fifty a month. That looks rather nice. But whereabouts in Hamilton Road? Towards the western end. Oh, that'll be very noisy. I know the area. Yes, it's pretty lively. But some people like it, though. Well, what about this house in Devon Close? That looks lovely. There's a big demand for houses in that area, so prices tend to be quite high. But this one hasn't been decorated for a few years, which has kept the rent down a bit. It's got a living room, dining room, and small kitchen, and it's five hundred and ninety-five a month. I think it would suit you from what you've said.、Mm, it sounds fine. Why is that part of town so popular? Well, there's a big scheme to improve the district, and it'll soon have the best facilities for miles around. What sort of thing? There's a big sports centre under construction, which will be very impressive when it's finished. In fact, the swimming pool's already opened ahead of schedule, and it's attracting a lot of people. What about cinemas? Are there any in the area? The only one closed down last year, and it's now in the process of being converted into a film museum. The local people are trying to get a new cinema added to the scheme. I think I heard something about a plan to replace the existing concert hall with a larger one. Ah, that's due to start next year.、Ah. Well, it sounds an interesting area to live in.、Mm. Could I go and see the house, please? Yes, of course. Conversation six: Work experience and studies course. I've been reading your personal statement, Paul. First, let's talk about your work experience in South America. What took you there? Was it to gain more fluency in Spanish? Well, as I'm combining Spanish with Latin American studies, my main idea was to find out more about the way people lived there. My spoken Spanish was already pretty good, in fact.、Mm, so you weren't too worried about language barriers? No. In fact, I ended up teaching English there, although that wasn't my original choice of work. I see. How did you find out about all this? I found an agency that runs all kinds of voluntary projects in South America. What kind of work? Well, there were several possibilities. You mean construction, engineering work? Yes, getting involved in building projects was an option. Then there was tourism, taking tourists for walks around the volcanoes. Which I actually chose to do, and then there was work with local farmers.、Hmm. But you didn't continue with that project. Why not? Because I never really knew whether I'd be needed or not. I'd thought it might be difficult physically, but I was certainly fit enough. Now I, I wanted to do something that had more of a proper structure to it. I suppose I get demotivated otherwise. What do you think you learned from your experience? It must have been a great opportunity to examine community life. Yes, but it was difficult at first to be accepted by the locals. It was a very remote village, and some of them were reluctant to speak to me. Although they were always interested in my clothes and how much I had to pay for them. Well, that's understandable. Yes, but things soon improved. What struck me was that when people became more comfortable with me and less suspicious, we really connected with each other in a meaningful way. You made good friends. Yes, with two of the families in particular. Good. What about management? Did you have a project manager? Yes, and he gave me lots of advice and guidance. And was he good at managing too? That wasn't his strong point. <laughs> <laughs> I think he was often more interested in the academic side of things than filing reports. He was a bit of a dreamer.、Uh, and did you have a contract? I had to stay for a minimum of three months. My parents were surprised when I asked to stay longer. Six months in the end. I was so happy there. And did anything on the administration side of things surprise you? What was the food and lodging like? Simple, but there was plenty to eat, and I only paid seven dollars a day for that, which was amazing, really. And they gave me all the equipment I needed, even a laptop. You didn't expect that, then? No. Well, I'll look forward to hearing more. But now let's look at these modules. You'll need to start thinking about which ones you'll definitely want to study. The first one here is gender studies in Latin America.、Mm. It looks at how gender analysis is reconfiguring civil society in Latin America. Women are increasingly occupying positions in government and in other elected leadership positions in Latin America. I think you'd find it interesting. 
If it was to do with people in the villages rather than those in the public sphere, I would. OK. What about second language acquisition? Do you think I'd find that useful? Well, you've had some practical experience in the field. I think it would be. I hadn't thought about that. I'll put that down as a definite, then. OK. What about indigenous women's lives? That sounds appropriate. I thought so, too, but I looked at last year's exam questions and that changed my mind. Uh, don't judge the value of the course on that. Maybe talk to some other students first and we can talk about it again later. OK. Yes. And lastly, will you sign up for Portuguese lessons? My Spanish is good, so would I find that module easy? Mm, not necessarily. Some people find that Spanish interferes with learning Portuguese, getting the accent right too. It's quite different in a lot of ways. Well, I'd much sooner do something else then. All right. Now, what we need to do is... Conversation 7. Looking for a job in a hotel. Hello, West Bay Hotel. Can I help you? Oh, good morning. I'm ringing about your advertisement in the Evening Gazette. Is that the one for temporary staff? That's right. Yes, I'm afraid the person who's dealing with that isn't in today, but I can give you the main details if you like. Yes, please. Could you tell me what kind of staff you're looking for? We're looking for waiters at the moment. There was one post for a cook, but that's already been taken. Oh, right. Um, what are the hours of work? There are two different shifts. There is a day shift from 7 to 2 and a late shift from 4 to 11. And can people choose which one they want to do? Not normally, because everyone would choose the day shift, I suppose. You alternate from one week to another. OK, uh, I'm, I'm just writing all this down. What about time off? You get one day off, and I think you can negotiate which one you want. It's more or less up to you, but it has to be the same one every week. Do you know what the rates of pay are? Yes, I've got them here. Uh, you get £5.50 an hour, and that includes a break. Do I have to go home to eat, or...? You don't have to. You can get a meal in the hotel if you want to, and there's no charge for it, so you might as well. Oh, good. Yes, so let's see. I get uh, 221... no, no, 231 pounds a week. You'd also get tips. Our guests tend to be quite generous. Um, is there a uniform? What about clothes? Yes, I forgot to mention that. You need to wear a white shirt, just a plain one, and dark trousers. You know, not green or anything like that. And we don't supply those. That's OK. I've got trousers. I just have to buy a couple of shirts. What about anything else? Do, do I need a waistcoat or anything? You have to wear a jacket, but the hotel lends you that. I see. Uh, one last thing. I don't know what the starting date is. Mm, just a minute. I think it's sometime around the end of June. Uh, yes, the 28th, in time for the summer. That's great. I'm available from the 10th. Oh, good. Well, if you can call again, you need to speak to the service manager. Her name's Jane Irwin. That's U-R-W-I-N. And she'll probably arrange to meet you. OK. And when's the best time to ring? Could you call tomorrow? Um, she usually starts checking the rooms at midday, so before then if you can, so she'll have more time to chat. I'll just give you her number because she's got a direct line. Thanks. It's 832-009. Two three double o nine. Eight three two. Oh, okay. Uh, y yes, I'll do that. And by the way, she will ask you for a reference, so you might like to be thinking about that. You know, just someone who knows you and can vouch for you. Yes, no problem. Well, thanks very much for your help. You're welcome. Bye. Bye. Conversation eight. Plan to improve the suburb. Good morning, and welcome again to your city today. With me today is Graham Campbell, a councillor from the City Council. He'll be telling us about the plan to improve the fast-growing suburb of Red Hill. Good morning, Graham, and welcome to the show. Good morning, Carol. Now, Graham, I understand that there has been a lot of community consultation for the new plan. Yes, we've tried to address some of the concerns that local groups told us about. People we've heard from are mainly worried about traffic in the area 
and in particular the increasing speed of cars near schools. They feel that it's only a matter of time before there's an accident as a lot of children walk to the school. So we're trying to do something about that. Another area of concern is the overhead power lines. These are very old, and a lot of people we spoke to asked if something could be done about them. Well, I'm happy to report that the power company have agreed to move the power lines underground at a cost of eight hundred thousand dollars. I think that will really improve the look of the area, as well as being safer.、Mm, that's good to know. But will that mean an increase in rates for the local businesses in that area? Well. The power company have agreed to bear the cost of this themselves after a lot of discussion with the council. This is wonderful news, as the council now has some extra funds for us to put into other things like tree planting and artwork. Now, we've also put together a map, which we sent out to all the residents in the area, and on the map we've marked the proposed changes. Firstly, we'll plant mature pine trees to provide shelter and shade just to the right of the supermarket in Day's Road. In order to address the traffic problems, the pavements on the corner of Carberry and Thomas Street will be widened. This will help to reduce the speed of vehicles entering Thomas Street. We think it's very important to separate the local residential streets from the main road, so the roadway at the entrance to Thomas Street from Day's Road will be painted red. This should mark it more clearly and act as a signal for traffic to slow down. One way of making sure that the pedestrians are safe is to increase signage at the intersections. A keep clear sign will be erected at the junction of Evelyn Street and Hill Street to enable traffic to exit at all times. Something we're planning to do to help control the flow of traffic in the area is to install traffic lights halfway down Hill Street where it crosses Day's Road. Now, we haven't only thought about the cars and traffic, of course. There's also something for the children. We're going to get school children in the area to research a local story, the life of a local sports hero, perhaps. And an artist will incorporate that story into paintings on the wall of a building on the other side of Hill Street from the supermarket. And finally, we've agreed to build a new children's playground, which will be at the other end of Hill Street, close to the intersection with Carberry Street. Wonderful. Now, what's the next stage? Well, the final plan. Conversation nine. Discussion about studying at university. Hi, Jeanie. How's it going? Oh, hello, Dan. Pretty well, thanks. Have you managed to get the money for the course yet? Yes, that's all sorted out now, thanks. It took long enough, though. It was practically a year ago that I applied to my local council for a grant, and it took them six months to turn me down. That's really slow. And I thought I was eligible for government funding, but it seems I was mistaken. So then I asked the boss of the company I used to work for if they would sponsor me, and much to my surprise, he said they'd make a contribution. But what about college grants and scholarships? There must be some you could apply for. Yes, there are, but they're all so small that I decided to leave them until I was desperate.、Uh-huh. And in fact, I didn't need to apply. My parents had been saying that as I already had a job, I ought to support myself through college, but in the end they took pity on me. So now I've just about got enough. That's good. <laughs> so now I can put a bit of effort into meeting people. I haven't had time so far. Any suggestions? What about joining some college clubs? Oh right, you joined several, didn't you? Yes, I'm in the drama club. It's our first performance next week, so we're rehearsing frantically, <laughs> and I've got behind with my work, but it's worth it. I'm hoping to be in the spring production too.、Oh, I've never liked acting. Are you doing anything else? I enjoyed singing when I was at school, so I joined a group when I came to college. I don't think the conductor stretches us enough, though, so I'll give up after the next concert. And I also joined the debating society. It's fun. But with all the rehearsing I'm doing, something has to go, and I'm afraid that's the one. Do you do any sports? Yes, I'm in one of the hockey teams. I'm not very good, but I'd really miss it if I stopped. I decided to try tennis when I came to college, and I'm finding it pretty tough going. I'm simply not fit enough. <laughs> Nor me. I think I'll give that a miss.
I'm hoping it'll help me to build up my stamina, but it'll probably be a long haul. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> Thanks. How are you finding the course? I wish we had more seminars. What? I'd have thought we had more than enough already. All those people saying clever things that I could never think of. It's quite interesting, but I wonder if I'm clever enough to be doing this course. I find it helpful to listen to the other people. I like the way we're exploring the subject and working towards getting insight into it. How do you get on with your tutor? I don't think I'm on the same wavelength as mine, so I feel I'm not getting anything out of the tutorials. It would be more productive to read a book instead. Oh, mine's very demanding. She gives me lots of feedback and advice, so I've got much better at writing essays. And she's helping me plan my revision for the end of year exams. Do tell me, I always struggle with revision. Well, the first thing is to find out exactly what's required in the exams. Hmm. Would it help to get hold of some past papers? Yes. They'll help to make it clear. Right, I'll do that. Then what? Then you can sort out your revision priorities based on what's most likely to come up. I put these on a card and read them through regularly. Uh huh. But that isn't enough in itself. You also need a timetable to see how you can fit everything in in the time available. Then keep it in front of you while you're studying. I've done that before, but it hasn't helped me. Maybe you need to do something different every day. So if you break down your revision into small tasks and allocate them to specific days, there's more incentive to tackle them. With big topics, you're more likely to put off starting. Hmm, good idea. And as I revise each topic, I write a single paragraph about it. Then later I can read it through quickly, and it helps fix things in my mind. Oh, that's brilliant. I also write answers to questions for the exam practice. It's hard to make myself do it though. <laughs> Well, I'll try. Thanks a lot, Jeannie. That's a great help. No problem. See you around. Bye.